The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everybody. Welcome, welcome to this uh, very short 30-minute se session on, from my latest book, uh, Winning Teams. So we've got a really great audience here. I just want to make sure I'm being heard. Just go to the question box over on the right-hand side. You'll see a little tab. Just open it up and type in the word clear. At least I know that I'm being heard. So if I could ask you, thank you, Brendan. Thank you, John. Thanks, Will. Thanks, Margaret. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Jenny. Thanks, Robert. Excellent. So we've got people in all sorts of industries online here, but I guess the point is that you're working with people. That's one thing, hopefully. <laughs> Uh, and the other issue, of course, is that continuous improvement is always important, you know, in any business and any public sector, private sector or not for profit. So you've really got to look at how you can create this culture of innovation and continuous improvement. So hopefully I can give you a few clues on how we might do that today. I'll be sending you a copy of the slides and the recording, incidentally, at the end of this presentation. So just relax and enjoy. We're going to whirl through a number of different aspects of this in the next 30 minutes. But if you've got any questions or want to make a comment, for example, if you go to that question box that you just typed in, if you just type in your question or your comment there, I'll get to see it and of course I'll respond to it as soon as possible. All right, so let's get underway. And I guess there's three things I'd like to cover today. The first thing I'd like to cover is where do we actually start? So I don't think, I, I'm sure I'm preaching to the converted here. I'm sure all of you would accept the need to continually improve. And the question is, where do I start? Because it can seem quite overwhelming. So that's the first key question. Then of course, how do we do that? What's the processes that you might look for to be able to achieve this innovation and continuous improvement in your own organization? And then, of course, once some ideas emerge, once we've got some suggestions and, and some opportunities to improve, the question is, how do we assess the viability of those? So they're the three key points I want to touch on today. And obviously, you can get more information from my book, Winning Teams. So they're the three keys. So let's get, get underway. Uh, this is the model of teams that comes out of my book. And the only point I want to make here, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but you'll notice on the outer layer, there are eight characteristics of high performing teams. And ultimately, those eight characteristics are critically important to any team success. If you cast your eyes up to the top, you'll notice, well, sorry, to the left, you'll see improve systems. That's ultimately what we're going to be looking at today. How do we improve systems? So that's one of eight. Now, the good news is if you improve your systems, there'll be other aspects around the model that you'll improve as well. That's the good news. The bad news, of course, is if one of those eight characteristics is suffering in some way, it'll either directly or indirectly affect other characteristics of high performance. So in other words, all of those things are interrelated, although for the purposes of today, we're only going to be looking at improving systems. All right, so let's look at where we might start. And that's an interesting question because it can be enormously, you know, it can be a, an overwhelming concept. Where do I start? Well, the, the way I would look at this is I would consider what mandatory team activities chew up most of your time and perhaps with little result. So if you look at your, uh, you know, the work that you do, whether it's writing reports, whether it's teaching, whether it's, um, you know, maybe it's meetings, maybe it's sales. What is the core activity where you spend the majority of your time now, it makes sense that that's the place to start because obviously if you're spending most of your time doing an activity, a small improvement in that activity will obviously give you a great result, even if it's only a few percent or 
So the place to start is what's the core activities in your business? And what are those activities that you should look at? And once you've identified what they are, then of course that's the place to focus your attention. So what systems can be changed? Then you can start looking at this, looking at those activities and ask yourself the question, what are the systems that we could actually change or improve or even, believe it or not, eliminate? Because some systems actually can get in the way or they become redundant. And what might, what might make a difference? So the two key questions is what systems can we change and what might make a difference in the end? So this is pretty important starting point. And then of course, so often when people talk about innovation and continuous improvement, they think, oh goodness, where do we start? How can we be innovative? And of course it was a nice idea and it goes in the too hard basket. So what's your core activities? That's the key point I want to make up front with you. Now, the thing I would say to you, which I think is extremely important, is that this is, people might say, well, you know, whose role is this? And some of your team members may think that this is your role, but I don't believe that's the case. I think basically your whole team should be involved in innovation and continuous improvement. Now, there are a couple of very good reasons for this. One reason, of course, is that you're basically using several different perspectives. So obviously other people, particularly those who might be at the so-called coalface, might have some clear ideas because they're you know, working on those activities on a regular basis and they have intimate knowledge of them. So one good reason is that you've got a number of different heads working on the problem. So that's one good reason. Now, the drawback of that, of course, is it does take time because you've got to meet with the team and all the rest of it. But if the trade-off is that we get some quality, into, you know, we get some quality feedback around our systems, processes and procedures, then it's obviously worthwhile. Now, the other reason it's important to get the team involved is that you want them to be, you want buy-in. And the old saying that people don't argue with their own data is critically important. So you actually want the team to be committed to whatever it is you decide to be the improvement in your area. And by having them involved in the discussion, it'll be a much easier proposition to get them on board. In other words, it's like winning the hearts and minds of people. So a couple of key concepts up front that I think are really important. One concept is where do you spend most of your time? And secondly, how can we engage everybody in the team involve, to, to involve ourselves in this continuous improvement? So the process that we might look at is threefold. And what I suggest is that you've, of, you've of, often, you've, you've got to create the time and the space to examine your systems. Now, this is, you know, you might be looking at this and you're obviously a convert to the whole idea but we're all busy. We've got myriad things happening in our life and things coming from all over the place, from everywhere. So you've actually got to create a space. Now that might be a team meeting or it might be a half day workshop, whatever it might be. If you don't create the space, the space won't materialize. It's like everything in life. If it's important, then we've got to create it. We've got to create the time and the space for it. So people say, "Oh, I'm too. I'd love to go and exercise, but I'm too busy." Well, we've got to create the space. And so that's the first thing. And I often work with a lot of executives, and they're they're very time poor, obviously, like most people. And often the common criticism about executives is that they're not out and about enough. You know, they're not out, you know, you know, with, with people. And my comment when I'm working with the executive is you've actually got to create that time. It's not going to just materialize all of a sudden. You're not going to be sitting there and thinking, hello, I've got half an hour. I can go out and meet and greet. It ultimately means you've got to actually make the opportunity. So that's the first key point. Then what you've got to do is you've got to initiate a discussion or a conversation about how systems can be improved. All right. So you've got to, you've got to run a process where you've got your team involved in this. So if you're a team leader, 
best place to start, of course, is with the team. If you are in a large organisation and you happen to be in a very senior role, best place to start is with your senior team. So we've got to initiate and start a conversation. Now, I'll give you some tips on how to do that. And then, of course, you've got to involve and engage people in the conversation. And hopefully the people that are in that meeting have got good knowledge of the core areas that you decide that you want to look at. So a couple of key things there, create the space, get the people involved and initiate a discussion. So uh, one of the things that you can certainly do, uh, which I think is a very powerful process, is an after action review. So what I've said so far is sort of preempting and being proactive around the process of continuous improvement. But I think this is a wonderful opportunity called an after action review. Now an after action review is probably a fancy name for a debrief. Now the military use it, and any of you who've had a military back background would understand the weight that's placed on an after action review. Ultimately the after action review happens at the end of a project. So when you've finished a project, instead of just launching into the next project, what I strongly recommend that you do is that you spend a little bit of time with your team running through what's happened while it's fresh in people's mind and while it's current. Because the coming back to it one, two, three weeks later is not realistic. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen because other things will get in the way. So there are three key questions in an after action review. There are a lot of versions of the after action review out there and some of them are quite complicated. And unfortunately, some of them are, are embedded in a continuous improvement methodology, which, is, which unfortunately becomes a kind of a, a box ticking exercise. So this is something which is, a, it works extremely well, but it does concern me that lots of organisations don't use this at the end of a project. Now, when I say a project, it could be anything at all that involves a group of people. So the very first question you would start to facilitate a conversation with your team would be the question of what went well. Now, even if it was an absolute disaster, there's something that went well. And so by starting with the positive, we're creating an upward spiral of positivity, not a downward spiral of negativity. And that's really important. So what actually went well? And it's a good idea to document this. So the idea is, you know, get yourself a whiteboard and write down all the things that went well and just hear what people have got to say. And once that list has been exhausted and, and really take your time with this, because when you first ask people what went well, regardless of you know, how the whole project went generally, people are a little reluctant to come forward. So you've got to push that a little bit. So what actually went well? Then the next set, then the next question, once that's been exhausted is, what didn't go well? Now, again, even if it was an absolute success story, there's always something that didn't go well. So, you know, really try and prize that out of your team and again, I'd be listing all of these things on the whiteboard. So what didn't go well? Now, what we've actually done here, or what you've done in your team, is you've created a buff you've you've created a kind of a this is what went well, this is what didn't go well. And this gives you an opportunity to discuss the project with your team. And by doing that, it really does lead very nicely into the final question. So take your time with each of these questions. It's not just a case of breezing through and getting one thing that went well, one thing that didn't go well. You need to do a thorough analysis of the project. And of course, if you've got the people who are involved in the project in the room, it obviously helps. Now, the final question or the third question, which ultimately is the most important question, is what will we do differently next time? Now, you'll find that this will work extremely well after you ask what went well and what didn't go well. So it, that means that people are engaged in, in the conversation around the project. But then the key question is, what will you do differently next time? 
And again, you record this information on the whiteboard so that, you know, you've got a record of it and come up with, even if there was only one thing that you came up with out of that after action review that was practical and easy to implement, then obviously you are continuously improving. And the psychology of the after action review is that by getting your team engaged in the debrief on the project, you will find that they will be completely engaged in the improvements that have been identified from the after action review. So, you know, you might get, let's say you get 10 things that could be done differently next time, which is a good, which is wonderful if that happens. Obviously, you've got a good conversation going. But at that point, you may not be able to, you know, take on all 10. It's probably not practical. So you might then say, OK, we've got 10 things here that could have been done differently next time. Which of these 10 do you believe will give us the greatest results for the least amount of effort? Which is a great question. And so you've identified one thing and you, then, of course, you can go to town on implementing that. So the after action review is highly underestimated, but extremely powerful. So you can have a conversation up front about core activities. You can also have a conversation at the end around a debrief around the project. And that gives you a sense of looking back on what has actually happened, as well as looking forward, of course. Now, um, so there, there is a couple of frameworks to use. Now, just to give you a very simple example about this, uh, I did. I, I was speaking to someone who was in the police service, and they were they were a senior detective. And you know, you can imagine they'd go to a crime, and uh, maybe there was a murder or something like this. Uh, and they'd get their detectives, or she would tell me that she'd get her detectives outside. You know, once they'd left the, the property, and before all the detectives went home that evening or even sometimes in that morning before they left and everyone's tired and probably emotionally drained at that point, as you can imagine, she'd ask them, <clears throat> she'd ask them the question, what did we do well in this investigation? And just hear what people say. This is a stand up meeting out in the car park, basically in the street. Then she'd ask, what didn't we do, uh, do well? and she'd hear what people have to say. She set a ground rule. She expected everyone to be engaged in this process. And then the question is, what can we do differently next time we have a similar sort of set of circumstances or a similar investigation? And again, she hears what happens. She tells me that it takes about five to 10 minutes to debrief, and it can make all the difference while it's fresh in people's mind. And then, of course, people go home. So the after action review is a great thing. And if you doubt the power of it, Peter Senge, who's a guru in learning organisations, had this quote to say. And he basically argued that the after action review is the most successful organisational learning tool ever devised. And so that's pretty high praise from somebody who's a guru in this area. So for a continuous improvement methodology, that is certainly a very good way to, a very good thing to do. Now, what I want to do at this stage is just think about some of the key improvement questions that you can ask. And, uh, you know, so you might think, well, heavens above, where do we, what questions do I ask? You know, I've got this group of people in front of me. Well, here's some great questions to ask. So one of the questions that you might ask is, how can we do, how can this process be done quicker? All right, so perhaps in a private sector organisation, we might be looking at approvals for loans, or we might be looking at something along the lines of some sort of a response to a customer. Now, obviously, if you can do it a bit faster and still do it with the same rigour, then it's obviously an advantage to the organisation. So for some things, you can say, how can we do this quicker? It might be that we take out a process or perhaps we uh, join two processes together, whatever it might be. So how can we do it quicker? That's always going to be a competitive advantage in business. 
But I would also say it's true in the public sector as well. We don't want to take longer than we necessarily need to. So if you can do things in a shorter amount of time and not sacrifice quality, then obviously that's a, that that that's continue that's improvement and that's great. So that's one question you can ask. Going clockwise here, another question you could ask is how can this process be done more accurately? Okay, so some things that you're involved in, I know we've got some engineers in this uh, in this uh, forum and we've got, you know, people who work pretty much with detail. The question then might be how can we do how can we do this process more accurately? So how can we take out defects? How can we take out, say so if it's manufacturing, for example, or how do we minimise the number of faults and defects in what we do? So obviously not all these questions would be applicable for everything, but I'm, at least by me giving you this template, you can take this away and use some of these questions, depending, of course, on what it is that you decide to focus on as core activity. Another question you can ask is, how can this activity be done in a timely, timelier manner? So, you know, there might be a, a need to get things done, uh, not so much faster, but more in a timely fashion. So, for example, in your workplace, you may rely on other departments or other functions in the business. You might rely on their information in order for you to do your job. Now, if they're late getting information to you, then it's obviously going to impact on your capacity to get information done in a more timely fashion, particularly if there's a deadline. So one of the things you might decide to do is to get some cooperation going with those other functions and departments so that you can make sure that that information comes to you in a more timely fashion, which of course, will allow you to do the same. A typical example of this I find in organisations is board papers, or if it's a local government environment, is getting the elected representatives all of the papers that are required for their, uh, you know, their monthly council meeting, or any board for that matter. Often what happens is that it's a balancing act because obviously if the secretariat gives that information out too early, then clearly there's going to be some addendums that are going to be made because you want the information to be up to date. So you can't get it to people, you can't get it to board members too, too quickly. But then on the other hand, if you leave it to the day before, they won't get to read the papers and therefore they won't be well prepared for the meeting. So timeliness would be critically important there. But also in that sort of example, you're relying on all of this other information to come from various parts in the organisation and indeed outside. So there's another question. Another question could be, how can this procedure be carried out more cost effectively? So how can we cut costs? Now, again, this is not about reducing or sacrificing quality. So the question might be, how do we cut costs here and at the same time maintain the quality that we actually deliver. Now, think about this not just from a dollars and cents point of view, it's also a, a, an idea around time. So the time we spend doing things equates to money. So how can we do this more cost effectively might be about reducing the number of meetings we have or cutting the time we meet in half or whatever it might be. So. So cost is critically important for the public sector, private sector and not for profit. And it will be for quite a period of time, obviously, in this post COVID environment. Now, the final question you might like to ask is, how can this task be done with greater productivity? Now, productivity, of course, will mean different things to different people. But if you think about what you do and think about what productivity looks like, then obviously the people in the room will understand what you mean by increasing productivity. So there are five really good questions that you can use to drive a great discussion. And I can assure you, if you take time out, even for an hour to meet, and you used some of these questions, and you identified some areas to work on, your time will not be wasted 
provided, of course, there's some follow up. In other words, it's not just a meeting and a talk fest. You obviously have to do something out of the meeting. So there's some things to think about. Now, the other thing is, of course, once the ideas are generated, you have to make a decision about the ideas. And the way to do this is threefold. And think about it this way. And this was this is the criteria, if you like, to assess the viability of the ideas that come up from the conversations. So one criteria is how much time is it going to take to implement? Now, time is money, as we've talked about. So therefore, if this implementation is going to take six months, two years, two days, is that viable? So of course, you've got to look at the benefits that come out of that as well. But time is really important. And the other thing about time is the time of the individuals working on it. So your team, if they're going to be chewed up working on this improvement and not doing their core business, and there's no guarantee of a result at the end, well, that could be a waste of time. So the idea may not get a result. Complexity is around how difficult it will be to change. I also think complexity is not just systemic. If you think about complexity from a cultural point of view as well, so in other words, if this is a very traditional culture and people haven't been used to changing for long periods of time, that I would argue is also an issue of complexity. So have a conversation with your team about that. And the final criteria is the cost. So how much cost is involved? What's this going to cost? And how does this compare to the benefits that we might reap from the costs? Now, obviously, if the benefits outweigh the costs, you're in a good, you're in a good position, but you need to discuss that. Now, you can even go so far as to rate these things you can give it a score out of five on time, complexity and cost. So you get some sense of evaluation around some of the ideas that you come up with. So folks, that's it from me as far as the key concepts that I wanted to discuss. Remember, we've only got a short time today. Just a quick plug before we wrap up. If you're interested in purchasing a copy of my book now, I say pre-ordered because it's still at the publisher and because of COVID, it's, you know, it's taking some time to get published. But if you'd like to get a copy of it, and that is a pre-ordered copy, uh, I'm more than happy to uh, offer you a little inducement there, which is a free online program where many of these ideas that we've talked about today will be available and accessible to you. So in other words, you can start working on building a winning team before the book arrives. So when the book arrives, of course, you can use that. So I would argue it's about $675 worth the course online. And for the cost of $30 plus postage, and I would just simply invoice you or you can go online and order it. And I can explain all that to you. All you have to do is send me an email by the close of business today. And I'll be more than happy to put you on the list and I will send you a link to the course immediately. And of course, an invoice for the copy of the book. So folks, that's it from me. So there's my little plug. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, I have one of these every month. So by all means, go to my website and uh, you can look at other courses or other free webinars if you'd like to tune in. Uh, I'd be happy to host you. So thanks everyone. Um, and uh, thanks, Jackie. Thanks for the feedback. Appreciate that. And I look forward to perhaps hearing from you later today and keep your eyes peeled. You'll get a copy of the slides and a copy of the recording this afternoon. So thanks, everyone. Thanks, Paul. Appreciate the feedback. Lovely. Thanks, Brendan. Cheers. Appreciate it very much. So thanks, everyone. All the best and uh, have a wonderful weekend too. Thank you and goodbye.